Good morning, everyone. Uh, thank you for attending my talk to kick off this conference. Um, I'll start off just saying a little bit about myself. My name is Jonathan Prokus. Uh, I completed this uh, research during my undergraduate and graduate studies at Johns Hopkins University. Uh, I'm currently working at 26 Technologies in Arlington, Virginia, performing cybersecurity research on primarily binary reverse engineering and vulnerability research, as well as adversarial machine learning attacks and defenses. Uh, as well, I put a few of my interests and hobbies at the bottom. If you're curious or would like to talk to me about any of them, I'd be happy to come up after the talk. Before I get into the content, I just want to first of all thank all of the co-authors that helped me pull this uh, paper together and sort of guided me through this process over the last few years. Uh, they've helped immensely, and I just wanted to thank them again. Neil Finley and Yuji Xiao are here today. Um, feel free to stop by and say hi to us. So on to the paper. If you've read the title, you might be asking yourself what exactly perceptual hashing is. And to start, uh, a hash function is pretty much any algorithm that, that takes some arbitrary input, uh, which in this case we're using cat images, and produces some fixed size output, which I show the first 10 bytes of in the table below. Uh, the perceptual piece of a perceptual hash function is alluding to its design to embed image semantics within the resultant digest. Uh, and this allows this hash to be locality sensitive. Uh, the easiest way to explain what that means is sort of using this example here. Uh, here we have these two cat images, which look you know, different, obviously. And then uh, I occlude the cat image on the left with a red square. Uh, and, I hash, or, and I run all three of these algorithms through uh, these two hash functions, the first being a perceptual hash function, and the second being a standard cryptographic hash function, which I'm sure all of you know. SHA-256 is what I used. Um, and if we go ahead and highlight the differences between the hash digest here, we can see that uh, the perceptual hash function on the top remains largely the same even if we apply this red square on top of the image. Uh, and on the right, the digest is still largely different because the image is different. Uh, and so this concept is sometimes referred to as fuzzy hashing. Uh, and also I will refer to the output of these algorithms kind of interchangeably between the word hash and digest. Uh, I'm referring to sort of that output when I say that. Um, and if we look at the SHA-256 output, we can see that making this minor change of that red square uh, drastically changes the output of the hash algorithm. And this is actually a core principle of a cryptographic hash algorithm, or hash function like SHA-256. So how are these things used? Um, suppose that we have some client that wants to send an image from their device over to another device. Uh, and in this scenario, they are using Facebook Messenger. Uh, okay, oop, oop. There we go, I don't know what happened, okay. In this case, they're using Facebook Messenger, and uh, so first they'll send that image off to Facebook, and Facebook will use some media hashing algorithm to basically check the output uh, to see if it matches against a corpus of known illicit hashes. Uh, and those known hashes would be obtained from organizations such as the National Center for uh, Missing and Exploited Children. <sighs> Okay, uh, and uh, these illicit hashes do not come from uh, either client. Uh, and this is used in an attempt to basically filter out content such as child sexual assault material or revenge porn from the, the platform that these are being sent on. If the image doesn't match, then Facebook can just go ahead and send along the image to client B. Uh, so what happens if we wanna filter out more than just known illicit images? We wanna also filter out unknown illicit images. Uh, and to do this, uh, providers such as Google or Apple can implement uh, neural networks to classify these images as to whether or not they are illicit before sending it along over to client B. Uh, and so, great, this works all fine until we want to introduce an end-to-end -end encrypted setting. Uh, and in other words, what if we don't want the provider to be able to see that image that we want to send over to client B? Uh, well, now there's a problem because the pro provider can't scan the image to check if it's an illicit uh, content before sending it along their network. Um, and this was actually a problem that came up back in 2019 when the U.S. Attorney General, William Barr, uh, he co-signed uh, with a few leaders from the U.K. and AU, uh, and they wrote a letter to Facebook imploring uh, that they delay the use of ended encryption, uh, basically fearing that uh, for the safety of users because they would be removing these illicit content scanning capabilities. So back to the setting, one potential uh, solution to this problem is to move the monitoring onto the, onto the local client. And so here the app that you know, you're sending this on, Facebook Messenger, can run the content scanning locally uh, and s only send the image to the server when there is an actual uh, a, a detection or a match. Uh, but obviously there's some problems here. Uh, primarily the, the main issue is that the hash database and or the algorithm is now stored locally and a skilled uh, reverse engineer uh, can pull these things off of the device. 
Uh, and this can lead to many bad things, including uh, adding the ability to generate uh, two images which look completely different to a human but hash uh, the same to uh, the user. Uh, they could also perturb images to basically avoid this detection and send illicit material on this network. Um, and they can even go so far as uh, reconstructing the original material that the database was derived from uh, or by generating novel images using uh, LLMs trained on these weights or on, on these hashes. Um, and I think that when we're dealing with things like child sexual assault material, these are sort of unacceptable flaws uh, with these hash functions. So an alternative to client-side scanning is to, uh, is to apply a little bit of additional cryptography uh, where we can do something called a two-party computation uh, where neither the client nor the server has access to both the image and the algorithm in the database. Uh, and uh, the problem is that this setup is still susceptible to a few different threat models, especially if the attacker is able to generate those hash collisions that I had mentioned before, or generate images which would avoid detection uh, by using adversarial noise. Uh, and I encourage you to read more about these threat models in, the, uh, in detail and from our paper if you're interested, but for time's sake, I'll just continue on. Um, so interestingly, pretty late into our research, Apple released a perceptual hash function known as neural hash, which was designed to present uh, to pre perform CSAM monitoring locally on iCloud photos on your iPhone. Uh, unfortunately, within a few days of this algorithm being released, the machine learning community uh, was actually able to produce hash collisions, uh, which are shown on the right here, where both of those images uh, hash to the same digest, which is shown below there. Uh, and this is using uh, standard machine learning adversarial techniques that have already been around. Uh, and the reason why this works is because neural hash is a fully, uh, fully differentiable, just standard neural network. It's just a deep neural network. So we can use traditional uh, adversarial ML techniques to attack this, this algorithm. And so these collisions were generated in a largely trivial manner by many different sources. So if neural hash is broken uh, and Apple is indefinitely delaying its use, what about you know, other perceptual hash functions? Um, that's what this paper is focusing on. We look at two perceptual hash functions in particular, the first being PhotoDNA, shown in the middle, developed by Microsoft, second uh, called PDQ, which is developed by Facebook, shown on the right, um, and details about how these are actually implemented are in the paper, uh, but essentially these bit field, the sort of visual representations are uh, sort of derived from the image on the left, uh, and they're just sort of represented, representative of the digest, which I show at the bottom there. Um, and you can see that PhotoDNA has a lot more information than PDQ, which uh, will come up later on. Uh, additionally, the PhotoDNA algorithm is completely black box, where we pull this, uh, the algorithm actually out of a dynamic, like, shared object uh, library file and uh, through an existing app, and then we're able to run these hashes uh, via that DLL. Uh, so we don't actually have the, uh, the access to the core implementation of the PhotoDNA algorithm, and we're attacking this in a completely black box manner. Same thing for PDQ, even though we do have the implementation, we do it in a black box manner. Um, so just, just to highlight uh, sort of what these things are again, uh, these, these algorithms are designed to capture image semantics so that if we show here, we take an image and then put a little like, you know, yellow star on top of it, the two digests remain like very largely the same. Uh, between like these two images for each of these respective algorithms. So the question, I guess, remains, obviously, if neural hash was broken so easily, uh, can we employ some similar techniques to break these algorithms as well? Uh, neural hash was fully differentiable, so there are a few things that we have to do to sort of get those gradients back from these algorithms, uh, which I'll discuss in our attack, um, and uh, I'll just show later, yeah. So getting on to the actual attack, uh, the first attack that I will cover is our targeted second pre-image attack. So this is uh, being able to generate two images which look perceptually dis distinct to a human, uh, but they hash uh, what is under what would be considered a match, uh, which is beyond this sort of threshold. Um, and uh, the, so the image is shown on top, and then its respective hash is depicted as a point in space on the bottom. And basically what we do is at each step, we perturb the image on the top, and that uh, we you know, hypothesize that that will sort of move the hash uh, away from where it currently is, and then we can use all those perturbations to estimate a gradient uh, to basically inform our attacker algorithm in terms of what direction to move next for the next step, and then we're just gonna do it over again uh, until we reach that decision boundary, and then there we have uh, a match where these two images now on the right uh, hash to what is effectively the same thing, but we can see that they look you know, significantly different. Um, 
An additional note here is that the only information needed for this attack is to have the target hash. We don't actually need the target image. Uh, so uh, that's something to keep in mind. The second attack that uh, we implement in this paper uh, is called our detection avoidance attack. Um, and here we're effectively doing the inverse of the previous, uh, where we apply some perturbations to the starting image until we reach this uh, decision boundary of what is considered a match. Uh, and then we can follow techniques described by the hop, skip, jump attack to sort of walk along that decision boundary towards a image that is more clear or I guess closer to the original image. Um, and uh, the resultant image will have less visual noise than what the, the first like, thing on the boundary is. So enough with you know, all the preamble, let's just get into some results. All right, so as a preface, I am definitely cherry picking the best result here, but uh, if I just want you to ask yourself which of these two images would you consider a match, and assuming that none of you are artificial intelligence, I would hope that you all say that the two cucumbers are considered the same image. Uh, but however, let's pull up what their photo DNA hashes are, so with this perceptual hash function, and uh-oh, uh, these two images on the right now are hashing to what is effectively the same, uh, whereas you know, we can see that they're very clearly not. So we performed this attack on 30 randomly chosen image pairs from ImageNet, and for photo DNA, 17 of them reached a baseline within our target of 20,000 iterations. And in fact, a lot of them reached far below that baseline of what a hash collision is considered. Um, and again, here's just sort of showing in more detail. If we have our starting image on the left and we apply some minor perturbations, we can get to column B as the baseline for what is considered a hash collision. Uh, but we can go even further than that and continue to add adversarial perturbations until we get the hash to look even more like the target. Um, Similarly, for PDQ, uh, we run this on 30 image pairs, and this one is actually able to reach the baseline thresholds for all 30 of them in far fewer iterations, uh, mainly because we had to use a higher learning rate because there's less information in the hash. Uh, and immediately, you will probably notice that there is significantly more visual noise in this one when compared to photo DNA. And this is just simply due to the fact that the PDQ output is about a fifth of the number of bytes as the, uh, compared to photo DNA. Um, however, we're still able to generate hash collisions, as you can see at the baseline here in the first column, we're at this L1 distance of 88 from the target hash, which is what we consider a match. Um, and then we can continue this to get all the way down to actually what is considered a perfect hash collision, where these two hashes, uh, these two images on the very right hash to exactly the same thing, uh, but this obviously devolves into noise. Um, so to sort of continue to highlight uh, what this attack is doing. I'm just showing a little animation of what, what the attack is, uh, of the progress of the attack. So as we ad apply adversarial noise, it might be hard to see from the back or whatever, but uh, as we're increasing that L2 distance, which is the amount of visual noise in the input image, uh, we can move this sort of hash closer to what our target is. And we can see that this gets all the way down, like well below the baseline of 1800. Um, and you can probably just see visually that it's slowly starting to look like the one on the right. Um, and we do the same thing for PDQ. This one obviously devolves into noise a little bit quicker and there are just sort of fewer changes being made uh, because of uh, just far fewer information. Um, so on to the second attack that we implement. Uh, this is the detection avoidance attack where we can generate two images which look semantically the same but hash to completely different values. And so on the left, we have our starting image. And then in the middle, we apply perturbations to get to the baseline. And you can see there's a, a ton of visual clarity remaining. Uh, and then even if we go far beyond that hash baseline threshold uh, up to 4,000, which our baseline is 1,800, there's still tons of uh, image clarity remaining in that image. And now these two images on the left and right hash to absolutely like, completely different things. Um, so, uh, yeah, uh, so where do we go from here? Um, I think this work is pretty much highlighting that perceptual hash functions are susceptible to adversarial machine learning attacks. And it is definitely so important to have something in place for sort of performing this illicit content monitoring. Um, but the problem is using these perceptual hash functions within an end encrypted setting sort of breaks the security guarantees that are pro provided by that setting. And in some cases, it can actually provide additional side channels to leak incredibly sensitive information, such as the data that's used for flagging that uh, child sexual assault material. Um, and uh, we also put our uh, paper through the, the artifact review process. Uh, to validate that these, uh, validate these results, but we don't actually make our attack code public for ethical considerations. Um, and if you want to read more about anything covered during this talk, feel free to visit our website or um, go to the paper. Uh, I'm 
planning on making more changes to the website as time goes on through this conference, but uh, there's an initial step there. And uh, thank you for listening to my talk. I'll be happy to take questions now um, or answer afterwards. <laughs>